Good evening, everyone, and thank you for coming. This is Inside Letter History, a fireside chat. I would like to thank Mr. Joey McDonald for being my guest this evening, a personal friend and a very wonderful member of our community. I'm going to go ahead and start right at the beginning. Let's get the dirt. Where did you grow up? Grew up here in Chicago, um, on the near west side. Um, yeah. Um, it's back in the 60s. Um, my parents were both involved in the um, civil rights movement, and we were taught very early that we had to get back to the community. So it started my community. Well, your uncle David was gay, and he had a profound influence upon you. How so? Um, actually, I had three gay uncles. My mother's and his three brothers were all gay. Um, yeah, it definitely runs in the family. Um, my uncle David was the youngest of the three, and he lived with us the longest. Uh, when he got out of the Navy, he moved to Chicago and lived with us until he met his partner, um, who was the person that actually showed me what a weatherman was. I didn't realize what I was looking at, but I knew I wanted it. Um, this man showed up at the house. He was roughly about six foot tall, leather jacket, blonde hair, slicked back, motorcycle jacket, boots, jeans, and I looked at my uncle and said, I want one. <laughs> he told me I had to get my own. Um, but that was the first weatherman I saw. And my uncle, um, kind of guided me. Um, he and his partner owned a store, which is where the North End is, and they both lived around the corner from uh, Man's Country, so I got to see Man's Country opening up. Uh, but when I was hanging out with my uncle at his store and hanging out at their place afterwards, um, they talked to me a lot about being gay. Um, they let me know that it, there was nothing wrong with it. Um, they also gave me lots of books to read. Um, so I got my uh, first vision of gay porn from going through reading their bookshelf, um, which is kind of fun. They would always send me home with books saying, don't let your father see me. <laughs> so, <laughs> yeah, it was all good. I remember you mentioning um, a leather jacket that had a particular interest. Yeah, I didn't quite understand what the interest was at the time. I just knew John had this jacket on, my, my uncle's partner, and I just was, I gravitated towards it. You know, I would sit in his lap and stroke the jacket, shiny, you know. <laughs> I didn't realize how excited I was until many years later and realized what my Vikings were, uh, but yeah, it was quite interesting to, for a young boy to have that early access, so to speak. At age 13, you were cruising your sister's boyfriends. Oh, Tell us a bit about that. <laughs> okay, so my mom died when I was 13, and um, that's when I started using drugs and alcohol, and I also started exploring my sexuality. Um, my sister, who's four years older than me, I was always watching her boyfriends. And when she would get rid of one, I would kind of figure out how I could sit in his lap. I would ask them if they would teach me how to kiss, um, which some of them could. Um, eventually, I got fucked for the first time by one of them. Um, during one of my sister's best friend's wedding, um, he, the guy got a little bit tipsy, and I convinced him to come home with me, come across the street, and uh, yeah, had my first uh, experience that way. Uh, I wasn't smart enough to take him to my bedroom. I took him to the bathroom across from my father's bedroom, and when my father came stumbling into the house, that was the first thing he saw. <laughs> And I did one of those, get off of me. <laughs> um, 
Yeah, and then I thought, I'm going to be dead in the morning when my father wakes up because he's going to realize what happened. But all he said was, be careful. So uh, I thought that was a pretty good... Uh, my father, that was his way of letting me know it was okay, just to pay attention to what I was doing. And probably not go after my sister's boyfriend so much. <laughs> Get one of my own. You were once a hairstylist. Oh dear. <laughs> Please, expound. Okay, so imagine little gay Joey at home on a Saturday night with the family sitting around and um, my mom and my sister had real long hair and I decided I was going to open up Joey's hairstylist shop and uh, I took all my sister's little hairstyling books that girls used to have in the 60s and I asked my mom, can I do your hair? She looked at me and she looked at my dad and my dad kind of shrugged his shoulders and she said, okay. Um, she liked what I did, so it became this big thing on Saturday or Sunday night while they were watching Bonanza or um, Walt Disney World. Um, I would do my sister and my mom's hair. Uh, this is really cool. They, they paid me a dollar, you know? <laughs> but, hey, that's really nice. And I tell all the girls in the neighborhood, you know, I'll do your hair too. They weren't going for it, though. <laughs> You've depicted living in a bit of a tumultuous time in the city of Chicago. What sorts of things did you see in the 60s as you were growing up there? Okay, um, I grew up on the west side, uh, near the west side of Chicago, right outside of the uh, University of Chicago area. Um, when Martin Luther King got killed, my neighborhood went up in flames. We were told to stay at home, um, but we could see orange in the windows. Um, my father's mother got stuck somewhere, and she called my father up. It took him like three and a half hours to go about, but it should have taken him about 20 minutes. And the entire time we were waiting to you know, hear back from the police or something that something had happened. Um, the neighborhood that I was in, when I, my first recollection of it, it was a very mixed neighborhood. And after the riots of 68, um, the neighborhood completely changed. Um, all of the doctors, young doctors, the interns, the Latins, the Irish, the Italians, the Mexicans, all moved out. Just left a little bit of a shell of a neighborhood, so that was kind of scary. Um, I saw a lot of stuff down in um, Grant Park when I was growing up. There were a lot of um, rallies. Uh, not all of them were peaceful. Uh, I was not allowed to go down. I wanted to the Democratic stuff that was going on, um, but my parents thought I was too far too young for it. Um, I remember my parents both being involved in uh, some of the marches that Martin Luther King did, it, but we were not allowed to go. Um, yeah, there was a lot of stuff that happened in Chicago in the 60s, late 60s. But tell us about dancing on Soul Train. Ooh. <laughs> okay, so Soul Train started in Chicago. <laughs> And it was one of those things that every person, every kid of color, um, wanted to be on Soul Train. Uh, that was a big thing. Uh, you had to be 13. Uh, and so I had to wait until I was in high school. Um, one of my friends from high school, uh, her and her sister and I, started dancing together at school dances and decided we'd try for Soul Train. Uh, we actually were called to come on. We had this... Back in those days, you had to dress up special. So we would uh, go down to Woolworths, for those of you who were around back in those days, uh, and buy easy sew patterns 
<laughs> we would make these outfits. Um, yeah, uh, purple jumpsuits, um, blue velvet uh, knickers. <laughs> uh, yeah, we made these really outlandish outfits because we wanted to be seen. Maybe it was I wanted to be seen. She just went along with it. Uh, and we would make these elaborate dance steps up. And uh, more often than not, we would win, and we got to come back. That was a big thing. If you won Monday through Thursday, you got to come back on Friday. And, uh, not like it was anything really important, but it was a big deal for us at the time. Uh, that was real fun until I met this guy named Ray Ray. And some of you guys know who Ray Ray is. Whenever he was on the show, there was always a tie, and I kept going, bitch, get the fuck out of my space. Uh, Ray Ray and I ended up being very good friends, but we hated each other in high school, just for the dancing. It's like we couldn't, we were in each other's space, so yeah. That's all trying. Did you ever make national TV? Or was no, you home? know, that's the thing. When they moved out to, D, uh, to LA, they didn't bring any of the people up in the town for Elias. Uh, they didn't take any of us out there. They hired professional dancers uh, to be on the show. Davida Joe Freeman uh, was one of them. Uh, yeah, they didn't bring any of the people from Chicago. And it was all teenagers from high school in Chicago, and they, they changed the whole format. So. But you served in the Navy. Tell us about that. Why? <laughs> Why are mine? Okay, so. I joined the Navy in 1974 because uh, my best friend, who was um, getting ready to graduate from high school, got into an argument with his father and decided he was going to join the Marines. And I thought, you're going to die. Uh, so I said, let's join the Navy together, thinking I would have a chance to talk him out of it. And he said, yes and uh, wanted to go to the recruiter the next day, so we did. And I thought, I still had a chance to talk about it, but um, I ended up going. Um, my father, his first question was why? Um, knowing that I was gay, he was just a little concerned that the military would not be the place where his little gay me. Um, <laughs> But I proved them wrong. It was actually a good experience for me. Um, I needed a little structure. <laughs> <laughs> Control. <laughs> uh, I joined the Navy for two years. I ended up staying for six. Um, and after two years of school, when I finally got to the ship, I found out I was going to be in charge of a nuclear weapon system, which was probably the stupidest thing that the military could possibly <laughs> um, I found, I had, I had been doing lots of experimenting with hallucinogenics, so to speak. Uh, <clears throat> and uh, having a 22-year-old on acid with a button for a nuclear weapon uh, is not the smartest thing in the world. Um, but I did it for six years. Yay! <laughs> I got to go around the world by the time I was 24. Uh, I spent my 21st birthday at the French Riviera. Uh, yes, a sailor does get one at every port, and I did my best. Um, I was shagging somebody, as they say, <coughs> on the Rock of Gibraltar and lost my step. Uh, <laughs> yeah, when I showed back up at the bar, my friends were like, what the fuck happened to you? I was like, no, I was about back. Uh, I slipped. <laughs> Fell down the mountain. Uh, yeah, there were a lot of stories like that. There was a lot of, where did he go? <laughs> where, where did he go? Are there any military people from any other country in the bar? Go find them. Go find them now. Uh, yeah. Lots of that. Uh, thanks to the military, I was introduced. 
officially to the weather. Uh, our ship went to Bremerhaven, Germany, and uh, we were forced to wear our uniforms off the ship, which was actually a good thing for me because I wandered into this bar with some friends of mine, and uh, I met a guy named Jens and his partner Thomas, and um, they invited me home with them. And my friends, who we were all sweater queens at the time, and they uh, didn't think it was such a great idea for me to come home with these guys, and I had four days off, and I thought, hmm, why not? So I did, and uh, I got back to the ship, and I had bruises and raw skin marks and a smile. <laughs> I had been opened up six ways from tomorrow, and uh, yeah, I couldn't wait for it to happen again. Uh, and my friends were like, I can't believe you actually went home with them. So I had so much fun. <laughs> What in particular did you experience for the first time with them? Uh, they had the St. Andrews cross. I did, never thought that I would like being flogged um, or having things inserted so deeply. Um, but it was it was an experience. I also did more poppers that night than or that couple of days than I thought was possible. Um, I found out what ethyl chloride was then too. Um, rags stuffed in my mouth. Um, yeah. Among so many things that were stuffed in my mouth. Uh, am I blushing yet? <laughs> yeah, it was, it was, uh, the awakening of Miss Jean Brody. <laughs> um, yeah, it, it was, it was a good time. Uh, and it made me want to do it more. Um, I just didn't believe that you could have so much fun doing those kind of things. Because those were all things that, as a sweater queen, I said, mm, no, that's not for me. No, 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 tie me up, no, not going to happen. Blindfold, no, inserting, no, no, beating me, uh uh. Cutting me, no, yep. <laughs> <laughs> and more, yeah. What other other scenes did you see at that time? You mentioned Germany. I didn't see a whole lot because there, I didn't know where to go really at the time. And as I said, my friends were sweater clean. Um, but I knew that there was a bar in Chicago that my uncle and his partner went to, and. My dad had died, and I came back to Chicago for the consecration of the gravesite, but I, it was over Mother's Day weekend, uh, 1979, and I called my uncle and his partner up in Milwaukee, because they lived in Milwaukee at the time, and they said, where's that bar that you guys go to? I know it's downtown, but you can't go there. Let me tell you about some of the things that I did. Uh, my uncle didn't want to hear it. Um, <laughs> but his partner, John, got on the phone and said, you know, the bar is called the Go Coast. And he told me what the address was. And he says, just be careful. Don't go home with strangers. <laughs> <laughs> well, I went to the bar. And it just happened to be the first night of the first IML. And, uh, Again, I'm in my sailor suit because I didn't have leather. And I asked if I could help, and uh, they can't get rid of me now. Um, John, <laughs> that's for you. You can't get rid of me. <laughs> um, yeah, so I, I volunteered at the very first IML, and I've been coming back ever since. Well, tell us a little bit about that first IML. What did you experience? Um, I experienced community for the first time uh, in the leather field. Um, I didn't know any other folk, you know, other than the couple that I had gone home with, uh, and my uncle's partner, which, you know, he wasn't doing anything with me. Um, but I, I met the bartenders at the bar, I met some of the contestants, I met people from all over the place, well, there weren't, there was 300 something people, so it wasn't from everywhere, but they were all friendly, you know, and they were all willing to talk to me about the things I was interested in, you know. It's like, 
how do you get involved in the clubs? You know, I had no idea that there were actually clubs out there until asking what the patches meant. Um, people were very willing to show me the way. Um, show me and talk to me about anything that I was willing to ask them, you know, that I was curious about. Um, I wanted to know about fisting clubs. Um, don't you say that. <laughs> um, I wanted to know, you know, how did I find somebody who can flog me? Because that was something that was very interesting to me. I wanted to know about bondage. Um, and I did get tied up. But it was being able to talk to people who actually understood what my interests were, and I could get knowledge from them. So that was a very interesting time for me. How have you seen IML evolve since 1979? It's done this whole circuit of being about the community to being about sex and drama and <laughs> drugs and partying to being about the community. Um, I guess everything has a ebb and flow to it. Uh, but IML started out, you know, it was about the contest. You know? um, and then over a period of years, it became about the party. And yes, the contest was still important, but people were coming, the circuit boys got involved. And it became about, are you going to, IML was considered like one of the circuit parties for a lot of people, um, which kind of pissed off the old guard, I hate using that term, uh, but a lot of the people from old guard were pissed off. Uh, and they stopped coming for a while. Uh, but as I said, it, there's been an ebb and flow, and it's gone back to a place where more older people are coming back, and the younger people, so there's there's a nice mix. Is there anything about IML that you miss from the old days? People. So many people that I met um, that just aren't here anymore. Um, good people. People who influenced a lot of people, who did a lot of things for the community. Um, yeah, I miss the people. In all these years of IML, what sorts of jobs have you had? What sort of volunteer work have you done or other things with IML? Um, I started out as a gopher. Um, it was you, you boy, do this. Um, I, the first year after I got back out of the Navy, 1980, um, I worked with the photographer. Um, Man's Country was a much different place back in those days. Uh, it was one of the premier bad houses in Chicago. Um, and they actually used to clear out the Whirlpool area, the steam room area, and they had a rooftop deck and I used to walk around with the contestants and help the photographer try to figure out poses for them and the best place. Not like I would know who would look good in a steam room or anything, but uh, <laughs> <laughs> that's the kind of things I was responsible for. And back in those days, you know, we'd take, you know, I don't know how many rolls of film, and I would have to leave Man's Country and go down to this place called Helix, uh, my dear born. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> and, and get, out there. get the film done into slides and then go back up to man's country and we would sit with thousands of slides trying to figure out what we were doing for the, yeah, back in those days we did slideshows during the contest <coughs> uh, and we had to figure out how many pictures that we had in each person <coughs> so that no one felt like they were being slided and put them all together. Yeah, that was a lot of running around. I did that for a couple of years. Uh, and then I got moved up to the IML office and worked in there for a while, just doing general paperwork, you know. Um, then I helped out as volunteer, I helped the volunteer coordinator for a couple of years. And then I took over that spot, did that for seven years. And um, then I got the job as Din Daddy, and that's what I do now. Let's explore that a little bit. How did that 
come to you? And what does it mean to you? Okay. Um, Walter Klinger, Klingler, I can never say his last name. Say it, Bill. You got it right. Okay. All right. So <laughs> he retired, and um, we were going to, you know, the executive committee was trying to figure out who was going to take his place, and Bill was asking everyone, and uh, I put somebody else's name in. And Bill calls me back up and says, uh, got the job, and it was like, all right. Um, I didn't think I could handle it. Uh, I, it just was a lot of responsibility to, to work with the testers. Um But I, since they believed in me, I thought I'll give it a shot. Um, so my job now is to work with the contestants and make sure that they feel comfortable when they're competing. Um, I answer questions, I give them direction, I make sure that they, with the help of a crew, make sure that they are where they need to be when they need to be there in the best proper way. Um, try not to leave anybody behind. Um, that's very important. Um, and just kind of try to be a voice of calm and reason uh, because that's, I can't imagine what it feels like to be in the position as a contestant. Uh, I've been with IML for a long time, forever, but I've never been a contestant at IML. And I know my personality, I'd snap. Somebody would get hurt uh, and would do me. Uh, <laughs> because I don't have that much patience when I'm dealing with myself. But with other people, I, I seem to be able to do that. So. It's, it's a very important job, and uh, I'm glad that I have it. Um, I, I feel like I'm able to give something back. Uh, whatever small amount that is, uh, I'm very grateful that I have that opportunity. What challenges does that have for you? Um, not being crazy. Um, It's, it's hard to explain uh, a job that helps me grow as much as it helps them grow. Uh, every year, there's more challenge to um, think outside of the box on how to help these guys stay in a place of uh, calm. And I have to drop whatever is going on in my personal life and be able to focus on the 52, 53, 56, however many guys there are, and allow what's important to them to be the more important thing for me at the time. That takes a lot of juggling in my brain uh, because I I have no control of shoots. I <laughs> um, but I, I I have to let go of my own shit in order to be able to be there for them, uh, which is not always easy, you know. Uh, I spend a lot of times with my pup saying, "I fucked that up again," and he's like, "Daddy, you didn't fuck it up. You did what you're supposed to do." You've seen probably hundreds, if not upwards of a thousand or more contestants come through that process. How have you seen the contestants evolve over all these years? Um, they become more political. Uh, early in the days, because I didn't deal with contestants directly, um, I didn't. Talked to a lot of them. I played with several, but I, did, <laughs> I didn't talk to them in that way uh, as to what they were trying to do in their, you know, by competing. Um, but I have noticed that as the years have gone on, the people's speeches have gone from just from just about you know working in their own private communities, small communities, to being on a larger international scale and you know things like Mr. Friendly, um, stuff like that, uh, Leather United, you know, um, 
there's all kinds of things that these guys have been doing recently that has stepped outside of the general bot and the small box of just simple community activism. And they've become you know, guys that are looking beyond their own community, beyond the walls, you know, borders of, of the U.S. even, you know. Um, so that, that's been really amazing and wonderful to see that happen. Where do you see IAL and its contestant group going in the next few years? Mars and Beyond. No. Uh, <laughs> um, I think that people are going to continue to uh, push the boundary of activism. Uh, there are so many things that's going on right now that people are starting to go, I can do something about that. And they're seeing they're looking back at what has already happened and saying, okay, if they can do that, then I can go a little bit further. That's a great thing to see. Uh, it's showing that community activism is alive and well. And it's a wonderful thing to see. Really, it's a wonderful thing to see. When I hear people say, well, what does the little community do? Really? Do I need to write it down? Um, it's a lot. It's a whole lot, and I love being part of that. What does sobriety mean to you and to the community? Sobriety means everything. I would not have anything that I have right now if I didn't have my sobriety. Um, I started using right after my mom died, and I used from the age of 13 to the age of 35. Um, I did lots of acid. I have brain cells that will never talk to each other again. Um, I did crystal for far longer than people thought that it was around. Um, I smoke more pot in more different countries than my lungs are happy about. Um, and I got sober in 1991, and my life that was on a downward spiral changed. I've learned what gratitude is because of my sobriety. I've learned how to be grateful for the smallest things. I've learned how to be grateful for the comfort of my friends, um, for my family, um, for any and every job that I've ever had. Um, you know, it's, it's a daily gift, um, and it's something I try not to take for granted. I stay involved in the recovery community as much as possible. Um, I sponsor people I'm sponsored. Um, I'm involved with IML's recovery group, and I get to reach out to people from all around the world who come to Chicago um, that are in 12-step recovery, and it's, it's just an amazing way to look at life. Um, things that used to bother me don't. You know, I know what's important. And a lot of the crap that runs around in my head is not important. So yeah, my sobriety means everything. Have you had challenges in that arena with the contestants? Um, there have been a couple of contestants who have met chaos. Um, and various other things. But for the most part, at least in the last six years or so um, that I've been dealing with it, there hasn't been any problems like that. Uh, more and more people are being open about their recovery, which is a great thing because we there's no reason to be ashamed about it. Um, but there, I reach out to every class every year and let them know that not only am I sober, but there are several other people who are involved with I know who are in recovery and that they don't have to feel like they're alone, you know, because these guys are coming away from, from their support groups. And this is a very stressful situation, you know. It's very easy to pick up a crowd, you know, pick up something to calm your nerves. We're there to say you don't have to do that. That's really important. What do you miss about the old days of the community? 
back rooms. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> hey, that's the truth. <laughs> I was very popular in back rooms. <laughs> um, yeah. Um, I really don't know how to answer that question. <laughs> that's fair. What's the biggest misconception about you? <laughs> I see, see no evil, hear no evil, and speak no evil up there. Um, I, you know what? You'd have to ask somebody else about that. Um, because I think I'm pretty much an open book. I brought you something from Paris, and I'd like that to be the conclusion of our chat because it will open up a whole new vein for you here. So if I may get into my bag for a second. What is the significance of this? This is honey. <laughs> okay, so there's a story. <laughs> Several years ago, um, during IML, I ordered room service one night, and uh, the puppy and I ate, and we went to sleep, and we woke up the next morning, and he was frisky, and I was frisky, and I reached over onto the nightstand, and I grabbed what I thought was boob. <laughs> And I started putting it there, and I went, wait a minute. <laughs> the consistency is wrong. <laughs> oh, that's funny. Um, so I decided I needed to eat it. <laughs> and I came downstairs for our morning meeting, and promptly announced to everyone that I found a new thing to do with honey. <laughs> as I was wont to do in those days. Um, and uh, the guy who was doing security at the time started collecting all the little jars of honey <laughs> off of the tables, the several tables, and moved them over in front of me. Um, someone also got in touch with the hotel and told them. And so when I got back up to my room, there was a little box of honey. <laughs> So I decided, since I started, I opened up that door, I may as well stay in. Um, so I really started exploring honey and boys. Um, salt and sweet, it really is a treat. Uh, <laughs> and now I am getting honey from all around the world. Um, it's one of the things I always tell contestants, um, bring me honey from your country because I want to know what honey from everywhere tastes like on boys. Um, yeah, it's... I'm gonna die of diabetes. <laughs> I have eaten so much honey in the last couple of years. There are jars and jars and jars in my house. I travel... Anytime I go to a, anywhere, actually, it doesn't matter if I go to a leather event or not. Honey is always in my bag, and I always get more when I'm there because, you know, you never can tell. Uh, <laughs> might have a different flavor. Um, but yeah, it's, um, I should change my name to, to Yogi. <laughs> <laughs> or maybe Boo Boo. Yeah. Is there a geographical honey that you prefer? No, but there is cherry blossom, cherry blossom honey cream, cream cherry blossom. Yeah, I'm getting all tank tied thinking about it. Uh, <laughs> somebody actually sent me some from Japan, ordered me some from Japan, and uh, that was the first time I had cream cherry blossom honey. And the boy didn't want to go there, and I tied him up. Uh, <laughs> I actually slathered his whole body with honey and spent hours licking it off of him. He's quite hairy and he didn't like it. Um, <laughs> so, but for what he wants. Uh, yeah, 
man, I, you got me thinking now. <laughs> I've never had honey from France. Well, now you do. Goddamn Eric. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Anyone? <laughs> Volunteers? <laughs> Well, that concludes our formal interview for this evening. And Joey, I would like to thank you very much for being part of history and part of our chat. How often are you able to pick the winner? <laughs> Predict. Predict? We've gotten pretty good about that. Um, I'd say in the last like ten years. In the last ten years, uh, probably 70 percent, eighty percent. Yeah. It's all about how little baggage they bring. You know, because we all carry baggage but it's about how they show up and how involved they are and they don't stress about it. You, know, you can usually see that real quickly. How true they are. Yeah. How real, you know, it's like, there's this thing that we always say is, don't try to, you know, flood the judges because they're gonna see right through you. They've heard it all, they've seen it all, and if you try to be what the judges, you think the judges want to pick, it's not going to be. It's not going to happen. You got nine judges. How can you be with all of them? So, just be yourself. More questions. Hi. Um, this is just all a political question, somewhat. Uh, uh, as a person of color, what, what's your thoughts then in '79 and today, uh, being a person of color in the leather community? You know, when I first started coming around. Um, there weren't a whole lot of people of color, but we weren't pushed to the side. You know, it was it was that spot in the snow uh, sort of thing. Um, people noticed you easier uh, in a crowd, and often they would come up to you and talk. Um, there are a lot more people. There are clubs. There are events specifically for people of color these days, which is a really great thing. Um, and more people feel like they belong. I, I remember having a conversation with somebody back in, I think it was like 1982 or three, and they were some hung up on the term boy. Um, they were like, I can't, I'm, I'm submissive, but I don't want anybody to call me boy. And it's like, then don't let them call you boy. Why are you stuck on that term? Uh, but, you know, people have to get past their own little personal crap, and I know I did, but, yeah, I think it's a, a very welcoming committee, uh, community, and uh, all you have to do is show up, and people will welcome you in. Next. More questions. Uh-oh. Maureen, you have no questions. <laughs> I um, But the one that I want to know, at least, as a shelter person, um, what is a slur queen? Oh, okay. So, I'm a, I'm a child of the 60s and 70s, and uh, as I was growing up, uh, cashmere sweaters and chinos, Okay, go first of all, go I had to get beyond the days of platform shoes and bell bottoms and knickknack <laughs> shirts. Um, and then I thought that I was off on a card. Uh, and we bought cashmere sweaters from all over the world and, and chinos. And, you know, we got our shirts done at the laundry and starch and military creases. And, um, yeah, we didn't know how to put our sweaters on. We often wore them tied around our necks. Uh, that's the sweater queen. Um, polished beyond your wildest dream. Plucked eyebrows, uh, eyeliner. 
that's a sweater clean. <laughs> yeah, and I actually had no eyes on it when I actually walked into the first bar in Armour and I'm surprised those guys took me home. But they did. They washed my face, too. <laughs> yeah. More questions? What did you say, John? Oh, I'm sorry. Nick, you have no questions. Um, one of the things you talked about was that you were in the Navy. So, can you tell us a little about your initiation when you crossed the equator? Oh. <laughs> So, <laughs> those of you who know anything about the Navy know that there's an event called the Shellback Initiation. And that's for guys, when you cross the equator for the very first time, you become a shellback from a polywog. Um, my ship was USS California. Uh, Randy Schultz wrote about it in his book, Conduct by Becoming, as the gayest ship in the military at the time that I was on it. Um, <laughs> <laughs> and, and <laughs> I had two brothers who were in the Navy at the same time I was in, and they would send me letters going, what the fuck is going on on your ship over there that they're call everybody's calling it Little San Francisco. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know, I didn't do nothing. Uh, so, we were in Italy, and uh, they let us know that our holiday time in Italy was being cut short. We were going around to uh, the Indian Ocean for because, you know, the uh, embassy had just been taken over in Iran, and um, we were going around and being on point. But we were leaving from the Mediterranean and going around the tip of Africa, and they said, all right, we're going to have our show back initiation. So every division has to come up with one person to uh, be Miss Polywog. <clears throat> because King Neptune will not come on board the ship to grant everyone being shellbacks without a damsel. <laughs> <laughs> so, <clears throat> we had 26 divisions on my ship. And um, of those 26 divisions, I think they have like 18 or 19 divisions pick a gay man to be the contestant. So we went shopping together our last day in Italy. And we bought wigs and makeup and heels and fabric and yarn for hair and copper wire and yeah. <laughs> and the morning before we crossed the equator, um, we were told that we had to dress up. We were like, but the contest isn't until later today. You have to dress up now. Okay, alrighty then. So, <clears throat> imagine this. Sicily, no. <laughs> <laughs> A group of us got together and decided we were going to do each other's makeup and fix each other's hair and help each other get dressed. And, um, a very dear friend of mine was the captain steward, and he decided that he really wanted to be involved, even though he wasn't picked. And he baked me tits. Um, <laughs> so I had bread tits. Um, and um, we started roaming the halls of the ship. Um, we would see somebody standing down there by his office door, and it's like, get across. <laughs> and we would just kind of swarm around this man and leave lipstick prints on his face and take his cup of coffee and put lipstick prints all around and have pictures taken. Um, and then, you know, later in the day, they actually had the contest, and so we all got to get up on stage and get hoots and hollers and and they picked the guy who was going to win, and they told the rest of us we were written up for impersonating women at sea. <laughs> <laughs> but she told us to do this. <laughs> so the next day uh, was the actual shellback initiation, and uh, we were the ones that were put up front. Uh, they had us dress, uh, put on your uniform inside out and backwards. 
Okay. Um, put your underwear on top of your uniform. Put your shoes on top of your socks. And get down on your hands and knees and put your nose up into the butt of the person in front of you. And that's how we crowd around on the ship for our initiation. So yeah, uh, the military is <clears throat> not homoerotic at all. No. <laughs> no, just dress up as girls and, you know, on a ship of a bunch of 19, 20, 22 year old guys who haven't seen a woman in a long time. Yeah, we had dates. Lots of dates. It was a good date night. <laughs> nice. <laughs> so uh, you've known many people in this room for a very long time. And there is someone in the room that I would like you to tell us a little bit about and about your history with that person. You want to guess who? Yeah. He's behind him. Chuck's behind. Oh dear Lord! So tell us, hey you. Daddy. <laughs> so so tell hey, us you doing up there, there Daddy? <laughs> to, tell us a little bit about some of your more interesting experiences throughout the years with Mr. Renslin. Um, Even to the Gold Coast. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Chuck Renslin likes my ass. Okay, I'll just start it out like that. <laughs> Not, not the story I wanted. <laughs> which, which, which story? There's so many. This is the naked city here, you know? It's like... Yeah, that story. <laughs> <laughs> you mean the most recent one? No, I mean the one where you're walking up the stairs to the sailor and somebody slapped you on the ass. You slap me on my ass every time you see me, though. <laughs> he did. I, I had on my uniform and he slapped me on my ass and he asked me if, it, if I was a real sailor and I said yes. And he grabbed it again and he said, good. Um, he, <laughs> if anybody knows Chuck, you know that he's an ass man. <laughs> Which story in particular? Know. About how long have you known him? Why? I've known him since 1979. There, do you know how many stories are in there? <laughs> Chuck, tell me a story that I can tell them. <laughs> how about sweeping up the... Uh... Oh, God, God. Okay. So, <laughs> for many, many of you don't know that I, at one time I was an employee of Chuck's uh, at Man's Country. And I used to do maintenance there. Um, <laughs> okay, so this is months after I had spent a couple of hours in the steam room. Uh, <laughs> don't do acid and clean the steam room. Uh, <laughs> well, this is another acid story. Um, because I um, had been partying and uh, my friends told me, uh, you have to go to work. And I was like, oh, fuck. I had to go upstairs to the music hall. And uh, <clears throat> the music hall had uh, these big, huge pillows that had little bitty dots of foam in them. And people did all kinds of things on those pillows. And the little dots of foam would come out, and they would be on the carpet. I had to vacuum them up. But you're supposed to turn out the light going on to the uh, mirror wall first. Um, <laughs> and I didn't. Uh, so I was in the corner <clears throat> for a couple of hours vacuuming the same spot, going, God damn, dots! Fucking God damn things! Why won't it get in the goddamn vacuum cleaner? And you know, mirror balls. The light moves, so I'm thinking that it's the vacuum cleaner that's making them move, and they're not, and they're not coming in there, and... <laughs> so, somebody finally showed up and turned the light on, and all the dots stopped. <laughs> I didn't quite realize what exactly had happened at first. It was like, fuck. They stopped. <laughs> and then I hear 
supposed to turn the mirror wall off. <laughs> yeah. <clears throat> There are many stories like that for my time in man's country. <laughs> yeah, yeah. But we'll suffice with that. We've got time for one more question. Anybody? Do I see one over there? Yeah. <laughs> Without names or years or anything, what was your highest rank encounter at the Indonesia ship? It was the lieutenant. Um, he was actually on my ship. Uh, yeah, uh, it was a bet between a friend of mine and I on whether I should actually get him or not. Um, I knew the bar that he went to, and I knew just how drunk he got. <laughs> so, hmm. it's amazing how you can work people when you know what they're doing. Um, <laughs> And I could offer him something that his wife couldn't, because I have a longer neck. <laughs> well, I'm just being honest. <laughs> and no gag reflex. Yeah. It's been pushed back so far. I, you know, there's supposed to be a reset button back there or somewhere, but <laughs> so no one said it. And I don't care to find it. There's something about being able to... Never mind. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. But <laughs> mine... Oh, no, <laughs> okay, I'm just going to leave it at that. <laughs> I, would, I would like to thank everyone for coming, and a special thanks to the Central Hall. Thank you.